Okay, so, uh, yep, so hello everyone, we are going to start. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit late, a bit late because I was waiting you in the wrong room, like uh, usual. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so I'm very happy to welcome Cecilia Ricap today um, for this uh, for this joint seminar. So uh, Cecilia, if I'm correct, so you are now uh, associate professor at UCL University College London and also head of the the head of the research. Uh, at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, right? So at UCL also. And uh, well, I would say Cecilia is a, a leading researcher or academic in the field of economics of innovation and also in relation with international, uh, uh, international political economy. And uh, so she's really a specialist of like uh, intellectual monopoly and the way large uh, multinationals may uh, may accumulate intangible assets and power um, and also I would say she's really I don't know how exactly to, to say that in English but in French we would say a compagnon de route so uh, a fellow traveler a friend I don't know exactly how to say of the Epoch Master program uh, really <laughs> very important for this program if I'm correct you you are a former student of the no no okay okay I saw, okay okay sorry uh, okay you look like a, a, <laughs> a, a, okay. um, a former student. So anyway, I'm anyway I'm very super happy to to have uh, Cecilia with us today. And uh, so you are going to present. So you see the the title of the paper. And as always, so they are going to. So she's going to. So you have one hour, Cecilia, right? Okay, to present the paper, and then we will have a discussion. So Domitilia Caponio, right? Okay, Domitilia. Uh, Malika Shogunbekova. Okay, Malika. Et Sumini Siyambala Pitiya. Okay, so I'm correct. So you are going to do the discussion. Of, okay, perfect. And, uh, and then after the discussion, we have a, like free time of discussion with the, with the whole floor. Okay? Cecilia. I'm sorry, guys, we were still having a few technical issues. And there will be a technical issue because the slides are not, I mean, for some reason, I'm not connected to either room. I should be, but I'm not. So we cannot put the slides directly on the uh, video recording. But people can see them from the distance, I guess, I hope. OK, so hi, everyone. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, as always. And uh, although it's true, as Antoine was saying, that uh, my research focuses mostly on international political economy and the economics of innovation, I know this is a master's program that has other majors. And so I wanted to start my presentation today with some uh, motivation for everyone, why this should matter all of you. Besides the fact that, of course, I mean, it's, it's trendy to discuss about big tech companies. It's if you are in this master's program, you're interested in ecological issues, whatever they are. But still, I think that it's uh, what we're going to discuss today is also a relevant macroeconomic problem, which is why I decided to start with a few stylized facts also, as I was saying, to motivate everyone, but especially those that I believe that might feel less motivated by uh, this joint seminar. And uh, let me start by saying that although a lot of people uh, even Argentina's president, Javier Milei, think that AI is associated with a, a violent increase in productivity. Actually, if we look at the, the statistics, so far we haven't seen that increase in labor productivity. And in fact, especially uh, since the 2000s, we are seeing a process that uh, even the uh, former IMF Larry Summers has called secular stagnation. This is a puzzling question, both for mainstream and heterodox scholars, and there are different answers to why we are facing this slowdown in productivity growth. I'm going to come back to this discussion later on and I'm going to give you my own take on why we're facing this situation. But let me say that um, I, uh, for a person that uh, at least sympathizes and actually thinks that we should be uh, degrowing many sectors in the economy at least, especially in the global north, one could first say, hey, but it's not that bad to be stagnated. At least we are stagnated. But in fact, this is a problem because the problem is not simply that uh, we are facing a stagnation, but also that we are facing it in a context of increases 
increased inequality, both at the level of income and especially at the level of wealth inequality. So we have, uh, we are not seeing a, a significant expansion of the pie as we would have expected considering especially the second wave of the ICT revolution and even the first one, uh, the second wave of the ICT revolution being broadly speaking digital technologies. And what is even worse, we are seeing an increase in different forms of inequality. And uh, these two figures, both the stagnation one and this one, are for the world economy, but then focusing on the US economy, but similar things in, can, can be seen elsewhere as well. We can also witness a process of concentration at different levels. There is an, an increase in market concentration. There is also an increase in terms of the average markup over time. And of course, the outcome of a process where markets are more concentrated, profits are more concentrated, is that the share of the pie that labor gets goes down. And if this is the US, imagine peripheral countries. So really, this is the context in which we uh, are going to discuss today. First of all, what's an innovation? What's innovation? And I think that this is an important question for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're focusing on innovation in your studies or not. I will open the bottle one second. And then from there, from that discussion of rethinking what's an innovation today, what I want to do with you is give you for those of you that have zero idea and never heard me speaking before about intellectual monopolies, I will give you a sort of synthesis of my understanding of intellectual monopoly capitalism. For those of you like the Rome students that have already heard me speaking about this, might get a little bored at that moment, but I still need to get everyone on the same page to then focus more not only on how what I would describe as cloud hegemons, which are Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, are, have planned and are planning the development of AI, which means that the AI that we uh, have is the AI that they want us to have. But also, going one step further, I'm going to argue that all sorts of intellectual monopolies, not only the companies coming from tech, but also companies coming from the most diverse industries, pharma, automobile industry, mass consumption products, you name it, they're all using AI to plan. And uh, at the same time, from there, we're going to see that this planning exercise that leading corporations are capable of doing and that goes beyond their ownership. So this com we can think that in principle, every organization is capable of planning inside its uh, offices. It's capable of planning labor process of the workers that it directly hires. But however, one of the key takeaways of today's lecture is that planning uh, although at first sight may seem as uh, something that companies can do inside, again, uh, their, the perimeters of the production unit. There are some companies that plan beyond ownership, so some company, companies that plan other companies, and these other companies, of course, therefore lack a planning capacity and are planned by the other ones. And in this planning exercise, I will uh, introduce some of my ongoing research on why Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, and today I will mostly speak of Google, uh, just because it's the case study that it's done in a new paper that I'm writing with another co-author, and it's the one that I did. So it's the one that I can speak uh, to you with a lot of details. Uh, I will explain you why we think that it's not simply that Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are profiting from the fact that every single organization will need to somehow undertake a form of ecological transition, but on top of that, on, to on top of trying to find how they can make money out of the ecological transition, they're actually trying to plan a transition that suits them and that enables them to keep on uh, cementing their intellectual monopoly power and their role as cloud hegemons globally. And uh, I will finish uh, very briefly discussing why we need to go beyond the myth. So I will start briefly introducing that myth, which is the myth of innovation or the innovation myth. And I synthesizes, synthesized this myth already thinking in terms of digital technologies with these um, different headlines that you probably saw many, in many places. The first two refer to the idea of serendipity. How in principle, when we think of innovation, we're thinking of something that is completely the opposite to a planned process. 
in principle, innovation and knowledge production more widely is supposed to be the outcome of serendipity and ways in which uh, the industry has sold us this narrative include these ideas of moving fast and break things, which Mark Zuckerberg, uh, which is Facebook's now Meta uh, CEO, loves uh, quite a lot. But then also the idea to that innovating is basically to throw things at the wall and see what sticks. So it's a trial and error process where basically people uh, that are undertaking that process have no cap control capacity. You just prove whatever you can and then eventually something will stick. Then there is also associated with this, uh, with this idea, there is another one, which is the from the garage to the Nasdaq. Basically, what's, what is encapsulated there is that everyone can innovate. Everyone can innovate and become a big tech, be as successful as Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page and Breen and you name it. So actually, if you're not there, guys, it's, because it's your fault because everyone can go from the garage to the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq is um, one of the capital markets where uh, in particular, dedicated for tech companies in the US, the most important tech companies in the US are part of the NASDAQ. And then PDOOM is um, the probability of human extinction associated with AI. And this has become quite a, um, a frequent discussion lately. And why am I associating it with the idea of the innovation myth? Because there is also this idea that technology, because it's what we discover is also the outcome of serendipity, there is this idea that technology progresses by itself. And you may remember when uh, after the launch of ChatGPT, some people, including Elon Musk, signing a letter saying this must be stopped, and many others saying we cannot stop it, as if there was no one pushing the accelerator pedal. And there is clearly a lot of, a few someones pushing that accelerator pedal. And if we want to push the, the brake, it's possible to do it. But when we think of technology as progressing by itself, we kind of release people from their responsibility, release organizations from their responsibility in what technology we get and in how that technology is progressing, who is profiting from the technology and so on and so forth. And finally, of course, the one that uh, we listen to more often these days is that regulation stifles innovation. And in a context of secular stagnation, in a context of increasing inequalities, it seems that we are stuck between a rock and a hard place. We either simply accept that the innovators are the ones that we got, that this is the technology that we got, if we may like it or not, but we need it. We need it because in principle we live under the assumption that more innovation will eventually generate economic growth and that economic growth will generate prosperity in society. A lot of assumptions in the middle and a lot of things that actually are not happening. But still, uh, I will argue that this idea of regulation stifles innovation doesn't hold, this really doesn't hold water, but to understand it, we need to dig uh, deeper into what is an innovation then? What is really this about? And in the economics of innovation literature, what normally someone would introduce to you uh, is this. This distinction between the invention, for example, the new treatment and the innovation, an approved drug in the market. This not only springs from a linear model of innovation understanding that starts with basic research, then continues through applied research, and then that there is a process of uh, experimentation, and after that process, uh, wide adoption eventually in the industry, and that will lead to economic growth, so quite a linear understanding that has been challenged by many. But there are many things to challenge from this assumption. One, uh, again, that is quite known is that it's for, it's for getting the demand here. And post Keynesians would say, hey, but you still need to have a demand. On, if nobody is demanding this new drug, this really is not an innovation. You really need to have a social, rela what we are saying when we say you need demand is basically that innovation is a social relation. So it's not just a matter of saying I discovered something new, this is the ultimate of the ultimate, but really for society it needs to be validated as such. And this idea of uh, invention that then, and that then leads perhaps to an innovation is problematic in other respects as well. Another respect concerns the 
production process of the new knowledge itself. And how, by claiming that only the approved drug in the market is an innovation, we tend to neglect that all the labor that comes before is also indispensable for the production of the innovation. It's as if we were discussing the production of shoes and we would say that those that are treating the leather do not matter in the production of the shoe. So, by understanding innovation in this way, the innovation literature has completely forgotten of the process of, produ of production of knowledge and has forgotten of the fact that knowledge, in fact, is a very peculiar product because knowledge is at the same time input, process and output. We produce knowledge with existing knowledge, even challenging existing knowledge, and the output of that is more knowledge. So we are uh, seeing a quite unique case of um, of production. There is yet another critique that one can do, and it's that in this typical understanding of the innovation, we tend to think that every innovation is good. Because of the way in which it's presented, we tend to think that whatever new technology comes out is intrinsically good. It's intrinsically good because of all this chain that I was also explaining before uh, in terms of e the effects in economic growth. And by looking at innovations in this way, we uh, start having a, a lot of problems related to the uniqueness and the novelty of what has been produced. With the examples of the new approved drug in the market, it's relatively easy. If there was no drug to treat that disease before, we can say, oh, okay, it's new and it's, the out and it's the outcome of this creativity of developing knowledge on the basis of more knowledge, and the example works fine. But when we then have things that already existed before, and then like social media, Facebook was not the first uh, social network that existed. And nonetheless, can we claim that it, because it was not the first, it was not an innovation? And it starts becoming trickier and trickier when what it's been developed is not necessarily new from a technical standpoint. It's not that there are new uh, technologies behind and so on and so forth. So from this understanding, which is the conventional one, I instead prefer to speak of innovation as the result of this combined production of intangibles. So when we are producing in an innovation as a society, and in particular when corporations and different types of firms are producing an innovation, at the same time they are combining different things. They need to combine knowledge to some extent, and, and then we can discuss, discuss to what extent or to what degree each of this is playing a role in each of the examples. And this knowledge may not only be science and technology based, but of course it can also be experiential based. It can be knowledge that comes from the learning by doing, using and interacting. But there is also a narrative component. Google is Google not simply because it has the, uh, and we can discuss why it does today, but because it has the best search engine, but also associated with Google, it's the Google brand. And the Google brand is the construction of a narrative. There is no new, significantly new scientific technological knowledge or experiential way of organizing a production process that results in the Google brand. And also, more and more, uh, it becomes clear that in the production of these intangibles, we have data and information play a crucial role. But it's not now, it's not only now that we are living in this digital age, but also historically, and I can come back to this later on, I will just continue for the sake of time, summarizing that then innovation is this social relation that enables value capture on the basis of combining these different intangibles. So if we now want to go and speak of the intangibles production networking capitalism, what we see is that Intangibles are co-produced by many, and this is my way of portraying the many, organizations and people. But then, more and more, what we see is a process where all these intangibles, or most of these intangibles that were co-produced by many, are appropriated by a few. And an even smaller group is capable not only of appropriating the intangibles, which would mean depriving others from freely accessing those intangibles, but also making money out of the intangible, capturing value from it. And this is the, dis the difference between appropriation and asceticization. You can appropriate something, you can have a patent for something, but it's if there is no demand, if nobody is going to purchase what you're doing, you will not be able to capture an intellectual rent out of it. Either you sell it directly or, or inside 
uh, whatever process or product that you're selling. So I started with some stylized facts to motivate you all, and I will go to more stylized facts very briefly. I will not uh, go into detail into any of this, but just to say that more and more, whatever you look at, we see a process where this concentration that I was introducing before is at the same time uh, as or can be associated with the concentration of intangible assets. So the leading companies in today's capitalism are also those that are concentrating more and more intangible assets in different forms. You can see this by looking at the concentration of patents. You can see this by looking at the concentration of business expenditure in R&D, so part of the input of this process. You can also see it in terms of the split between tangible and intangible assets among the uh, largest firms in market capital in the world and we could continue with many other stylized facts that basically will point us to say that all forms of knowledge and information are increasingly being monopolized by leading corporations. So what we need to explain and this is where I move to uh, intellectual monopolies is why? Why did this happen? Why now also? And for me uh, there are four reasons that come together and explain why we have this prevalence of intellectual monopolies in society today. One refers to the specific way in which knowledge is produced. And knowledge is produced as a path-dependent product. So, as I was saying before, knowledge is input. We need knowledge to produce more knowledge. And another way to think of this is that you need to understand the knowledge in your environment. You need to have some uh, previously acquired knowledge in order to make sense of the new knowledge that is out there in order to produce more knowledge and to make that knowledge meaningful or relevant for the company. This leads to a process where the company that has innovated once will be better prepared than the rest of the, in the companies in the industry to innovate again before the rest. And this is, although seems quite obvious, at the same time, it's uh, completely opposite to what the different ways of thinking about innovation patterns have evolved in, economic, uh, in, in economics. Where even when uh, there is this idea of the big company as the innovator, even in that case, there is a still this understanding that any big company, now it's not any company, but any big company, can be the next one innovating. And here, what I'm arguing is that simply because of the way in which knowledge is produced, there is a tendency to generate industrial stratification with a sort of coyote and roadrunner scenario where the roadrunner is always winning the innovation race and the coyote is always trying to um, get the roadrunner without making it. But this could have happened at any point in the history of uh, capitalism and nonetheless we're witnessing it today in the last decades it's particularly obvious and prevalent and if you're interested in the evolution over history in the q and I'm super open to discuss what is different for instance between uh, AT&T or IBM or even General Electric in the past and the intellectual monopolies that we have today those companies were also intellectual monopolies but there, there has been a transformation there has been a change in how they exercise the intellectual monopoly. And this is in part the outcome of the other transformations. One is that, sci that the production of innovation has become more science and technology based over time. And the process of production of innovations has become more costly. It's true that once we operate under the, the umbrella of an intellectual monopoly, because the strategy of the intellectual monopoly will be to cut the production process in many small pieces, as if we had a big puzzle and then all the pieces will come together to create this sort of continuous or permanent innovation. It's true that each small piece can take place in a garage, but the whole puzzle cannot be produced in a garage. The whole puzzle cannot be produced by someone that doesn't have doesn't have the means to do it. So it's more and more expensive to control the whole R&D process. We've also witnessed a lot of institutional and political transformations. I will say two words about that in one second. But let me go first to the other transformation, which concerns technological change in itself. 
it's possible to cut the innovation process in many pieces because we have information and, and, and telecommunication technologies. Because I can connect on the internet and talk to people that are in whatever other part of the world, because I have also internet to find out who is doing what and where, and I can do that very fast. So for the organizations that are at the knowledge frontier, for those that not only are at the knowledge frontier, but expanding that frontier, it's very easy to identify who are the best to do each of those pieces of the larger puzzle and then outsource those pieces of the R&D process to those different organizations. So this, uh, and again, it's not that this could uh, depends exclusively, of course, on the existence of these technologies, but the fact that internet exists, that the fact that it's possible to communicate very easily with others has favored this process of outsourcing pieces and, and eventually thinking of the globalization of the production of knowledge or specifically of innovation. And in particular, artificial intelligence, I will come back to this later on, but artificial intelligence is quite unique because in itself, we can think of it as a potential new method of invention. You have a lot of data, you process it with uh, machine learning algorithms, and then once uh, what you get from there is what Anktat calls uh, digital intelligence, and with that digital intelligence, you can either repurpose your business, open new business lines, find uh, new potential cures for diseases, you can uh, improve your brand building, you name it. So you build new things using AI as a method, as a methodology of science. So if you think in terms of how this accelerates the process of production of knowledge and how it favors those that are concentrating more data and concentrating the capacity to analyze that data, it's a sort of uh, way of putting intellectual monopolization on asteroids. So the technologies themselves and what technologies we get are also not, and, and this starts going back to the question of serendipity, we have these technologies, these technologies is not that just by chance can be used for accelerating intellectual monopolization. It's not just by chance that the type of AI that we have is AI that can be used for surveillance or weaponry and we could continue with other uses. And I mentioned also that uh, there were a lot of institutional and political transformations that mattered in this history and probably those of you somehow familiarized with this uh, could have uh, could have thought of the intellectual property rights regime and how it has expanded and became an international one on the basis of the US system and the implications of that, the implications of being, uh, of becoming possible to patent even living beings, to patent code. And this is only one small part of a much larger story actually where many transformations have favored, in particular, leading corporations, and especially leading corporations from tech and pharma industries. And that includes, among others, the fact that for companies that are intensive in intangible assets, it's easier to profit from the loopholes in the uh, international taxing system, because you can simply say that your patents or all your intellectual property rights are based in Ireland, and you don't need to have a factory in Ireland, because you, you are not claiming that you're uh, you're actually producing anything in Ireland. You just say that your intellectual property is in Ireland and therefore your subsidiaries will pay to the Ireland subsidiary a royalty to get access to what has been patented and by with this mechanism you basically move part of your profits or most of your profits to places that operate as tax havens, for instance. This, again, for companies that are intensive in intangible assets, works much better than for a company that has to say that it's manufacturing in Ireland, then the regulator goes and finds that there is no machine, nothing in Ireland, and it's clearly a lie. When we look at these political and institutional transformations, we usually focus on what's happening on the side of like favoring concentration, and very little is... Um, analyze on the other side of the story. Because what is unique, what is peculiar about this form of intellectual monopolization is that we have a concentration at the top, but with turbulent peripheries around them. So we have a core of companies in every industry, if you want, but that doesn't mean that they are the only ones 
producing, innovating, and this turbulent periphery is particularly big in the case of tech and in the case of pharma with the emergence and expansion of startup companies. All these companies are this turbulent periphery that contributes to producing part of the new research that often fails, that takes the risks, and then only when it succeeds will profit, but only profit partially, because parts of the profits, and we will discuss a lot about this in relation to tech, but we can then come back and discuss it also for pharma and for other industries, part of the profits are harvested by the intellectual monopoly. So we have the same companies at the core with a turbulent periphery of where there is a lot of entry and exit of, if you want, the smaller companies. Although in this context, the idea of big and small loses part of its sense because more often than not these leading corporations that become intellectual monopolies because they are outsourcing the tangible part of the production process they are not as big as they could be uh, the if one thought about the IBM of the past for instance uh, just to give you one example and Apple is perhaps the most paradigmatic example of this story because it's a completely fabulous company. We will see that in the case of cloud hegemons, this is different. And they are investing and a lot in tangible assets, but these assets are not uh, this tangible part of the production process. It's not that they, uh, that they are uh, investing it in order to manufacture devices, but it's uh, a way to assure that they can keep on appropriating information and knowledge because the type of tangible investment is associated with data centers and other digital infrastructure. So let's uh, move on. I, we could continue discussing about all this. Of course, overall, there is a, if you want, in the discussion about planning, which is going to be a crucial and this part of my presentation today, there is an important thing to say, which is that it's not only that intellectual monopolies today are planning what science and technology we get, but also that in the past, especially after, during the Second World War and after it, up to the early 1990s, the big science and technology planner was the US state. In particular, what an author that is called Linda Ways calls the US national uh, security state. So the Pentagon the agencies related to the Pentagon, and eventually you can include there the president, the Congress, etc. So it's not that before this particular type of intellectual monopolies spread in all the industries, we had the serendipity that is supposed to be claimed uh, by many, but the planner was a state and not a specific company. So very briefly, if we have to give a sort of definition of what's an intellectual monopoly, we would say that these are companies that are constantly concentrating intangibles. These are not one-time innovators, and we can come back and rediscuss this, but if you're only a one-time innovator, you will lose your advantage. It's the fact that they are constantly recreating the barrier to knowledge that they can perpetuate themselves as intellectual monopolies. And this is why we can speak of permanent rentiers instead of temporary rentiers. It's not that they make permanent the rent associated to one specific uh, knowledge development, but it's that they are recreating this intellectual rent on the basis of capturing more and more forms of knowledge on the basis of their narratives and the data that they are harvesting more often than not freely from society. So, and just some caveats before we continue. Uh, although it's very easy to look at this story through the angle of intellectual property rights, and, and there is a lot to say about that. This is not only, and in the case of tech, not mainly a story about intellectual property rights. And you can simply hear, see in the ranking of the patent assignees in 2022 for AI, that big tech companies in particular, the ones that I will call the cloud hegemons, Microsoft, Amazon, and well, here at least you have Alphabet, but look at Microsoft and Amazon, they are clearly not at the top. And I'm not calling like the leader monopolizing intelli artificial intelligence a company like Toyota, not even a company like Samsung. However, they have more patents. They have more patents because some companies that are still in the, um, in the, with the mindset of patenting whatever. We can then go back to discuss this, but one important insight here is that patents are a very bad indicator for innovation, especially in the case of tech. It's, this doesn't mean that patents do not matter or that in general intellectual property rights do not matter. It just means that in a scenario where you have a big puzzle where different pieces 
are outsourced to different organizations, some of the results of this already slice and dice production process of knowledge can be patented, but it's more about the exclusive capacity to recombine all the pieces, what is unique about the intellectual monopolies, and not the fact that they are patenting the results. Some of the results are kept secret, and secrecy is a mechanism of appropriation as at least as important as intellectual property rights. And it's also the speed at which the innovation process is taking pl it takes place that also explains the perpetuation of these rentiers. If you're constantly innovating a new and moving the frontier very fast, before all the rest even understand what you are doing, and we could bring here someone from uh, Meta AI, Google AI, and that person can write on the board the latest algorithms that they are developing, and for us, it will not mean knowledge sharing. Because we will not, we don't have at all the absorptive capacities to make sense of that. So really, when innovation is moving so fast, in the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you have the intellectual property rights, because by the time the rest realizes what you're doing, you're already many steps ahead. Again, I'm not claiming, yes. Sorry, just a very short question, Cecilia. Uh, on this slide, or uh, with this definition, when you say continuous monopoly over intangibles, do you mean here intangibles like just patents, or do you want to go like beyond patents to encompass your values? No, definitely. There's intangibles in the sense that we define them here. So is this what they are concentrating? I'm just making I, I'm just making this a small clarification because m very often it happens that we just tend to associate the idea of intangibles with intellectual property rights and intellectual property rights with patents, and we are missing a lot of things there. The other thing that is important to clarify is that these companies I would just put it like this is that these companies are not necessarily market monopolies. Of course, we need to see an effect of mar at the level of market concentration. And I showed you in one of my first slides that there is, in, I showed you data for the US, that there is an increase in market concentration. But that doesn't mean that we need to arrive at situations with only one company in a market. And actually, defining the frontiers of a market is a very thorny issue. And it doesn't make sense to end up being lost in that discussion, because these companies, their advantage is not simply in a specific market, if you want to call it in that way, but it's actu actually their capacity to control capitalism at large and their capacity to be present in several markets and influence several markets on the basis of the knowledge that they have captured. So it's not necessarily, not exclusively, about their concentration in a specific markets, but about their capacity to accumulate at the expense of global capitalism. Which is actually what leads me to say that we were speaking about planning, and I already anticipated that intellectual monopolies have the capacity to plan beyond ownership, to control labor, to control the organization of labor, beyond the labor that they are directly hiring. And you can think of the global value chains as a very early example of how this works. You have a leading corporation that organizes a global value chain where there are many other organizations participating in the production process, and these organizations are not deciding what is being produced, how, when. I was, for instance, interviewing people from Nike, and they were telling me that when Nike decides what new shoe they will be producing, that shoe, then they send the new design to the different potential uh, manufacturers, and they not only say, we want this shoe, they say, we want this shoe, and we will pay between this price, like up to this price. We're expecting, and we will not pay you more than that. Can you do it, yes or not? And these are the number of shoes that I will require for that specific date. And the same happens with the iPhones and Foxconn and the other subcontractors. And the same happens with every global value chain. It's not a matter of we all together sit on a table and decide collectively what we are going to produce. It's a global value chain, yes, but those that are making the decisions are the companies that are at the top. This way of organizing a production process that is in between the, uh, if you want, the social division of labor that was supposed to take in place in the market as, an, as a supposedly uh, unplanned, anarchic space where every organization could do whatever it wanted, and the idea of organizing production according to the technical division of labor inside the factory, and, and think of the idea of the pin factory in Adam Smith, where each and every worker has a, a very specific and clearly defined role, 
what we see is a process where that way of organizing production inside the pin factory, now it's been expanded to and conquering part of what was supposed to be the space of the market, the unplanned market. The global value chain is one example, but it's not the only one. The franchising model operates in the same way, and we can say the same actually of platforms. What I'm interested in discussing here in very briefly, very, very briefly, is that innovation is also produced in the same way. And this is a way we can speak of a corporate innovation system where just like in the global value chain, instead of producing the Nike shoe, what is being produced is a new piece of knowledge. And that new piece of knowledge, again, this uh, process of slicing and dicing that I was mentioning before is also planned and centrally organized by an intellectual monopoly. And in the case of AI, the whole discipline, the whole field has been planned by uh, in particular Amazon, Microsoft and Google, especially Microsoft and Google. On the discussion about planning knowledge, I found very, uh, very attractive and a very good synthesis this snippet from an interview where a former IBM vice president clearly replies to my question about how they were organizing the production of innovation as serendipity is something that is planned. So insisting that really it's not that just you uh, leave things, leave things and to happen and you leave your R&D, your scientists, your engineers to do whatever they want, but you're actually steering what's uh, happening, in his case, inside IBM laboratories. And also in the case of the cloud hegemons, we see a process where they internally plant R&D along the similar lines of what these old companies, old intellectual monopolies or old giants were doing along the same lines of the Manhattan Project, if you want, for the atomic bomb during the Second World War in the US. Each of these companies still today has this sort of big R&D laboratories where they all together produce these big future lines of research that will be crucial, essential, or that the company thinks that will be crucial or essential for perpetuating their intellectual monopoly. In the case of Amazon, these are, this is the Amazon Grand Challenges division. In the case of AI for Google, this has been actually DeepMind, a company that Google acquired in 2014. It was a small startup and it became very, very uh, quickly a company of hundreds of AI scientists and engineers that thought that they were producing AI for the good of society that thought that they were producing AI in the way they wanted and that actually Google was not interfering where when in fact Google was defining what type of AI they were working on and steering their production of science and technology. And but it, the interesting part, because this could just be another story of okay, I if you heard the stories of Bell Labs, for instance, for AT&T, it could be just another way of saying these companies did the same thing that those previous leading corporations of the past and all the previous leading corporations of the past of in, in the 20th century eventually uh, started opening these big first research laboratories and then eventually research and development laboratories. What is even more interesting and what allows me to say that AI was planned by Amazon, Microsoft and Google is that they were able to plan the whole innovation network. So not simply what they were doing in-house, but actually how the whole discipline was evolving. So in a nutshell, if we define AI as the synthesis of code, data and compute, so we need the three things to have AI, just with the code without data to process and without data that is processed uh, in order to train the algorithm, you will not have an AI model. And to do all this, you clearly need a digital infrastructure. So if we define in this way the artificial intelligence that we have today, we can say that actually Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta have a control over the knowledge and the data that is essential for guiding the development of AI. But there is a difference where Meta is not present. And this is precisely the cloud. And this is why when I speak of cloud hegemons, I do not include Meta. Because Meta does have its own data centers, but doesn't have the cloud as a business. And I will. Um, explain a bit of this later on. Uh, but let me go first to some empirics on how they are controlling the whole field. Basically, here you have just a synthesis of which are the most important actors in the production of AI knowledge. This is a network of the organizations that are presenting 
uh, the largest number of uh, papers in the most important AI conferences. And because it's a network, what we see is connections between organizations. In this case, what makes the connection is the co-authorship. They are writing together a paper that then is presented at any of the most important AI conferences. We have, of course, universities. We even have French institutions like the CNRS on this map. But we also have big tech companies. And it's not just that we have big tech companies, but in fact, in particular, Microsoft and Alphabet, so Google, are the most important nodes of the network. This means that they are capable of structuring the whole network, which in this case means that they are capable of defining what is a relevant research in AI. They are the agenda setters. They are defining what is the priority in, term, in terms of AI research. Facebook is over here. Amazon is over here, and I can come back later on to the differences among them and why this is has been particularly relevant for Microsoft and Google. One could anyway say that it's great because papers are a way to share knowledge. And I'm speaking of intellectual monopolies, which would have seemed a bit uh, incoherent. But actually, in the papers, of course, they are not sharing the whole code of what they are doing. They are just claiming, we uh, designed a model that does this, this, and that, and the results are A, B, C, and D. And if you want to, for instance, compare the share of co-authorships, so a, a sort of proxy of the number of organizations that are working together with either Microsoft or Google or whatever of these companies with the share of co-ownerships of patents as a way to compare who they are working together and who they are sharing the potential profits associated to that research together. You would very um, quickly realize that although these companies are usually building knowledge, co-producing knowledge with many other organizations, and here you have the data for Microsoft. So in the decade that goes from 2012 to 2021, Microsoft co-authored paper, uh, co almost 90% of, of its papers, which means that nine in 10 papers had people developing the research that were not Microsoft employees. If you compare that with the share of co-owned patents, which means when Microsoft is recognizing that the ownership of something that from that moment onwards will become it also its intellectual property right is at the same time owned by someone else from another organization that only holds for 1% of the cases. Again, patents are only a little part of this story. And if we add to this picture also all the non-disclosure agreements with all the organizations they are working with and a lot of other things that we will see in one second, you will see that the scope of the appropriation and eventually the, the scope of asceticization is much, much larger. I, um, for the sake of time, I will go very, very briefly on this, but I want to make a point because normally when we look at these networks, the one that I was showing you here, and we read the names of all the institutions, most come from the global north. And it seems that institutions from the peripheries are not playing a role here, and that those suffering from this form of knowledge appropriation or knowledge extractivism are only leading institutions from core countries. This is just because these are the ones that are more frequently presenting also in these conferences with them. But when we dig uh, deeper, when we delve into what's happening in peripheral countries, we see a whole set of ways in which uh, these companies are not only extracting data from peripheral countries, but also knowledge. There are a lot of agreements and different ways in which they are also co-producing papers and co-producing uh, co research collaborations with organizations from the Global South. You have here uh, just an example of a col collaboration between Argentina's National Research Council and AWS, which is Amazon's cloud. You have also a lot of startups acquisitions that not only happen in the global north, there is a case of a startup from Brazil that was acquired in 2005 that for many was a search engine that was at least as good as Google search engine and it was acquired by Google. And we also have more and more, and I will go back to this from a, from a global perspective in one second, more and more uh, a way of investing and controlling the research that is being done by organizations around the world through the form of corporate venture capital. So these companies, in part with all the intellectual rents that they are amassing, they can then go and fund other companies and control the research and get privileged access to the research that these companies are doing. Of course, we have the historical 
brain drain. And today in the peripheries, we have a special type of brain drain also, which is literal, just brain drain. The person remains sitting in their houses in the peripheral country, but working for a company from the US or from other places. And one thing that I will not have the time to touch uh, on today refers to open source and how open source is not only about free labor and how more and more uh, developers from around the world are contributing to pieces of software that are put in open source by Microsoft, by Google, by Meta. Amazon is not so openly participating in open source. The other three are and a lot and lead now the open source community, as weird as it seems, because it has become for them a way also to set standards. It's a way in which big tech companies can impose their ways of doing things, can impose their pieces of software, and then sell complementary pieces, because everyone will be coding with their languages, everybody will be using their uh, libraries and tools because part of that was put in open source and therefore it's free and easier to adopt. So it doesn't mean that they, are, they have the best solutions, they just become de facto standards and this is uh, something that they are seeking also particularly, for instance, in the case of meta related to AI. But there is a, one thing to say also that is particularly relevant for, for our discussions today and is what I would describe as twin extractivism. Not only because behind all the immateriality of tech, we have lithium, we have cobalt, we have rare earth materials, and all that is mostly but not only concentrated in the global south, but also because the fact that when organizations from the south or from the peripheries are producing knowledge, they cannot use that knowledge for developing their countries, but that knowledge ends up being appropriated and monetized by companies from the global north, that reinforces unequal exchanges and further forces those countries, those uh, peripheral countries, to get dollars from the easy business. And the easy business is extractive business. So nature extractivism is reinforced on the basis of knowledge appropriation when organizations from the south end up producing knowledge that it's appropriated by intellectual monopolies from the north. I mentioned very briefly venture capital and the importance of corporate venture capital and this for AI has become crucial because probably you may be saying okay yes Google, Amazon again, whatever, but we also have open AI, we have Mistral, Aleph in, in Germany, we have Anthropic, we have, and you name it, infle yeah, there was Inflection AI, all these companies we are directly associated and subordinated to the big tech, in part because they depend on their funding. And this is the story of OpenAI and how OpenAI ended up launching ChatGPT. In 2019, Microsoft put $1 billion in OpenAI. It was its first investment in this company. And since that moment onwards, OpenAI not only uh, shares whatever it's developing with Microsoft in advance, way in advance, so it gives a, 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 a clear advantage to Microsoft, but Microsoft also steers what OpenAI is doing. Also tells OpenAI uh, directors, some Altman and others, what to focus on. And it was Microsoft who pushed OpenAI to launch ChatGPT with the GPT-3 version instead of developing a more advanced large language model and afterwards thinking of ways uh, in which that could be commercialized. So why? Why? I mean, besides the fact that they need money and we could uh, discuss a lot about this, but why is this becoming so important? So in the map, basically in this map, what you have is just um, a map of the most important organizations backing with venture capital AI startups. And it's just to show you here, for instance, Google, different, the different clusters ultimately refer to different focuses within the AI companies. And just to emphasize that here that tech giants in general, not only the cloud hegemons, use a lot this strategy to control startups. And they are present in every single cluster. So it doesn't matter if it's a startup that is focusing on AI for education or AI for healthcare. It's not just that they are funding the uh, startups that are working on the foundation models, the ones that are more generic, but even startups that are using AI models to develop a specific applications, they are also being funded by different tech giants. And here you have just uh, an account of the number of companies that were receiving 
uh, that had one of the tech giants among their uh, top five investors by February 2024. So. Uh, for instance, Google, which is the one that was by that time funding more companies, was funding almost 2,500 startups at that moment. Actually, it was funding many more, but they were almost 2,500 that had Google among its top five investors. Why is this relevant? Because you can give a bit of money, but if you are receiving one money from 100 different investors, the chances that uh, that company will have to actually influence the other one, one could say where it, they are not as important. But if you are among the top five investors, one can already claim that the capacity to influence the startups will be larger. An important part in this story is that part of this money never arrives in the form of currency. It's never wired from one account to the other, but it's actually taking the form of a cloud credit. It's simply the, a blank check for a certain amount of money that can only be used in cloud services. In particular, often used for the processing power or, or, and secondarily for storing data or the model. And let me go now directly to the discussion about the cloud and very briefly to the discussion about uh, how they are planning uh, the ecological transition. So the cloud is like a supermarket of technology, basically. It's not just a place where big tech companies directly offer computing pieces as a service, uh, but it's actually a sort of, if you, uh, of course you have all used Amazon as a marketplace. Imagine the same thing, but for computing services. That's the cloud. And you never really get access to the technology. On the cloud, what you can do is use the technology. You need to use a data set to train a model, right? That's perfect. You can go and purchase data as a service and then use the data to train your model, but you will never get access to the data. Do you need an AI model to uh, build an application on top? No worries. You can purchase a software as a service that is an AI model, for instance, for facial recognition, but you will never see the lines of code that, are, uh, that, that make the model you will just use it. So it's a way to use technology without really accessing the technology. It limits how much one can learn from using the technology because you don't understand what's happening inside that black box. And uh, when I say that uh, it's a supermarket of technology, this means that not only big tech companies are selling their own services, but that means that they also have third parties, just like in Amazon.com. And for instance, by January 2023, there were almost 7,000 companies offering services on Amazon's cloud. Of course, just like in the marketplace, whatever service is sold, part of the money goes to Amazon. And also, there is another specificity, which is that the infrastructure, the processing power, is only offered by, in this case, Amazon, the same for Microsoft and Google. And when I insist that these three are the cloud hegemons, you can look at this part of the slide where you see that the three together concentrate almost 70% of the global market. The um, different services that they are using are not only a black box, as I was explaining, which therefore reinforces this power relation between every startup that wants to develop an AI model, every startup that wants to develop even uh, whatever computing service from the old style one cyber, for cybersecurity, for uh, whatever application on the smartphone, whatever you want to do, even companies like Netflix or Mercado Libre, which is a platform from Latin America, every single company from the tech sector has already migrated to these clouds or will eventually do it. Because it's the only way not only to build the software, but also it's the only place to offer it. So it's not just that they go to the cloud because it's easier not to invest in everything in order to develop a small application for the phone, but also except for the cases of the, of, the soft, of the phone apps that have their own marketplaces, for all the rest, they are offered directly on the cloud. Who's the client? Of course, that part of the clients are the tech companies themselves. But another part of the clients are the, all the organizations around the world. And is, uh, this is, has a scope that is so, so big that even includes also states. Everything like the states, 
different levels of government are more and more pushed to migrate to the cloud and start putting all the state services on the cloud. Even things like Israel's cloud that is provided by uh, Google and Amazon through a project that is called Project Nimbus and uh, the workers from the companies have made an open claim saying that Project Nimbus actually is a way in which Amazon and Google are providing AI technology for the Israeli government to target Palestinians. So these technologies are not just, okay, we are sharing, we are selling some technology here and there and it's a problem of the tech sector, but really every single organization is becoming dependent of the technologies offered on the cloud. So when we think of intellectual monopolies and we think of their uh, capacity to control a production and distribution network and their capacity to control a corporate innovation system, we clearly need to distinguish within this group or among the group of intellectual monopolies between the big pharma companies, the automobile industry leaders, and Nestle and Ikea and Coca-Cola, all these are intellectual monopolies. Even Netflix or uh, Uber can be a considered intellectual monopolies, but they are definitely not cloud hegemons. The cloud hegemons are different, and the important question to, answer, to ask us is, how big is cloud hegemons' sphere of control? If everyone is depending more and more on the technologies that they have monopolized, of the technologies that are sold on a market that only they control, how big is their sphere of control? How big is their capacity to deprive others from knowledge that all these others need? And to answer this question, I've done over 100 interviews to AI scientists, AI engineers, and, that, and also management from the R&D sector of many, many companies. And basically, what I found out is that here is that cloud hegemons can even exercise an intellectual monopoly power on other intellectual monopolies. That all the other leading corporations in the world are becoming technologically subordinated to big tech, or in particular to the three that I call describe as cloud hegemons. And this is why, if we say that the um, the term that describes the relationship between an intellectual monopoly and the startups, the turbulent periphery, the universities that are also co-producing knowledge with them, the term that describes that relationship is knowledge predation, because we have these uh, less powerful or, or subordinate organizations that are producing part of the knowledge that then is monetized by the intellectual monopoly. If we look at the relationship among intellectual monopolies and how some become dependent on a few others, we can speak of cannibalism because it's a relation between those that are at the apex or at the top of this hierarchy of organizations. The question that we need to ask ourselves now is why? Why would a company like a big pharma, why would Toyota, why would Ikea, why would Coca-Cola, McDonald's accept to be cannibalized by a cloud hegemon? Why would Bank of America, BlackRock, so it's not just companies that are in the quote-unquote real side of the economy, even uh, like banks and, and financial organizations are also being cannibalized by Amazon, Microsoft and Google. So why? And one of the first reasons can be just to say, okay, because more and more, as I was anticipating, AI has become a method of invention. AI is used to produce intangibles. And if an intellectual monopoly is produced on the basis of constantly appropriating more and more intangibles, if you need to reinforce your brand, you will need to process data with AI. If you need to develop a drug and you're a big pharma company controlling a corporate innovation system for producing new drugs, you will more and more need to process data with AI at different moments, not only for the drug development, they also use AI, for instance, for the clinical trials. And here you have some examples of that. But there are other reasons which are at least as relevant. In the uh, history of technology with authors like Braverman and Benniher, we can see that actually the technology, in particular information technologies, were developed to control workers as well. It's not simply to make the life of everyone happy and we live happy ever, happily ever after. Part of the process at least, and a main driver in capitalism for companies is not just to win the competition. Yes, that's part of the story. But another part of the story is that technologies are developed to better control workers. What we see with AI is a 
if you want, a tailored way of controlling workers. The same, in the same way as Amazon nudges us with different things, and tells each of us, according to our profile, what we may want to consume next, in the same way AI can be used to nudge workers individually. And not only the workers of a of, that are directly hired by an intellectual monopoly, but also the workers that are part of its global value chain, its franchising model, and we could uh, extend it also to those from platforms. A third reason in all this story, and what I'm showing you are just snippets of interviews that uh, in a way provide evidence to this, uh, is to plan. It's not this process actually of pairing intangibles, the process of tailored control of workers, are part of the larger exercise that every leading corporation does today of planning, of corporate planning. And for corporate planning, the capacity to use AI, which is ultimately a statistic technique for prediction or forecasting, is extraordinary. It's super important to be able to use all this uh, or, and to harvest more and more data. And with all that data, then have the sufficient algorithms or techniques to make sense of the data. And basically, for that, big tech companies offer a lot of very powerful tools for planning and for visualizing complex sets of data with very simple indicators that then enable managers to make decisions. And you have here some of the examples, perhaps the most interesting one refers to demand sensing, which is a software as a service offered by Microsoft in, on its cloud. And this is someone from Nestlé telling me how Mars was using it and all the types of data that are being in, uh, use for this demand sensing, for this way of being constantly, when we speak of planning, it's not the old style way of thinking of planning. So we have a company that decides that in five years, the company wants to be there, and then it organizes the production process along where it wants to be, but then eventually when the planning exercise finishes, it evaluates what has happened and says, oh, maybe it didn't go as I wanted, I will need to recalculate this. Now they can recalculate almost on an online basis. They are constantly refreshing dashboards with tons of indicators that are the outcome of processing billions and billions of data points with different forms of algorithms, in particular with AI. So basically, if we go back to the Google 101, what Google claims is that their mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible, blah, blah, blah. What it doesn't say is that when you're doing this, you're making a lot of decisions. And all these decisions are political. What is measured, what is shown, what appears when and how and where. So basically, measuring, creating indicators, is essential for ruling. The ruler, and actually if you go to the history of how statistics emerge, states needed statistics in order to understand its sub their subjects, to understand the people that were living and the organizations that were living within those frontiers. So now what we are, see what we are seeing is that these indicators that became a prerogative, this uh, data process with AI that was a prerogative of big tech, now big tech, in particular the cloud hegemons, are offering it to every other intellectual monopoly so that they can also extend their planning capacities way beyond their own assets. So basically, as someone from, uh, from Microsoft was telling me, as if that person was selling me the services, you see your business. You have data from everywhere and even on paper. How you rationalize all the data is what makes Microsoft stay at the top of the trend and function efficiently with AI. So this is what they are offering to all their clients because answering ultimately who measures tells us who rules. So if we go back to this, um, yes, five minutes. If we go back to this um, sort of diagram, it's not simply that cloud hegemons are above the other intellectual monopolies. It's actually that they can also exercise an intellectual monopoly power on the other intellectual monopolies. And the sphere of control of cloud hegemons is ultimately global capitalism. If we go to how 
uh, the, this idea of planning with information technologies, we're clearly within the realm of cybernetics, which actually comes from a term that is called Kubernetes, that in Greek means a steerman or governor. So it's very, very close to this idea of ruling and governing that I was mentioning. And one thing that is interesting is this idea of second order cybernetics, which is actually thinking of a hierarchical multi-level of control, where each controlling system is controlled by another system. And this is basically the way in which I think that capital Capitalism is working, and on this basis, we see, and this is uh, the final topic of today, on this basis, we see how cloud hegemons are. You, why don't you see it? Oh, okay, now you do. On this basis, we can see how cloud hegemons are planning AI. So, what you see on the back is not uh, just like here on top, you have this like European Commission way of thinking of the transition and how digital technologies are supposed to be the enablers of the green transition. And there are a few companies that ha are uh, actually quite happy with that strategy. And these are in particular Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And what you see on the back is uh, actually comes from Google and their strategy of AI for sustainability. And when we think about these companies and the ecological breakdown, probably you would be thinking of this. You would be thinking of their massive consumption of energy and water, how they are now moving to nuclear, how they are also claiming to be climate neutral by purchasing clean energy in places where they are actually not consuming the energy and they still consume fossil fuel, but because of the ways in which they control indicators, they pretend to offset their um, carbon footprint by purchasing clean energy. But this is only a tiny part of the story. This is a very relevant part of the story, clearly, but it's only one part of it. Because we also, of course, have uh, Google, and the same goes for Amazon and Microsoft, but I'm just going to speak of Google. We have Google for the transition. So if we need to do a transition, if we are an organization that needs to, uh, and, and actually globally, we are trying to get an ecological transition, no worries, Google is already there for us. First of all, Google is already controlling the AI-driven environmental sciences. So how even the forecasting of weather is taking place with AI models. Of course, in part of their corporate venture capital, they have special lines dedicated to uh, companies or uh, startups that are pursuing ecologically friendly goals. But on top of that, they have many initiatives, including for the sake of time, I will just mention Tapestry, which is a digital mapping of the global electric grid. Imagine what they will do with that afterwards. If we want to provide energy in a more efficient way, we can think of AI as a way to forecast demand and enable all the uh, utility providers, being them public or private, to anticipate where demand will be coming from. For that, you need to have a mapping of the electric grid that it's a digital one. And that's what Google is doing. And they might be claiming that they will offer that for free, probably and for some time. But at the same time, as they develop the businesses, then they start charging for that to other privates and states, even if sometimes for research, they keep it public and open. And part of this strategy also concerns the way, the way they are controlling the narrative around this idea of the twin transition, which is basically this green techno solutionist way of capturing regulations. Not only because they are super present in the in different COPs and so on and so forth, but also because they are actually making the indicators that are being used to measure the evolution of uh, the different variables or the different, in, or, or the different metrics that need to be taken into account for mapping how the different COP-associated goals evolve. For instance, just to give you one example, they, uh, part of the, of the things that, are, that need to be measured by uh, different countries concern their mapping of fresh water. And for mapping fresh water, Google has developed, together with the European Commission and uh, the uh, UN, this freshwater ecosystem explorer. So these type of, uh, of pushes or, or ways of nudging not only individual consumers, but also, uh, also governments in terms of how to measure the different variables associated with a potential transition is a way in which they are 
making sure that that transition will be one that favors them. Which basically, and I will finish, yes, 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 I will finish with this, I will finish, this, this is just a, like, well, two slides, this slide and one more and then we finish. And I knew this was going to happen, it's not that I didn't know, I just knew it, but, yes, yes. So, uh, very briefly, summing up, the transition that they are planning, and this is not just Google, as I said, it's also Amazon and Microsoft, can be synthesized in these three points. One is an unrestricted use of AI solutions and data sets to address every form of ecological problem, which of course at the same time brings this potential Gibbons paradox where, because you are cons even if you're consuming in a more efficient way, because you end up consuming much more with no limits, you end up wasting more. But then at the same time, it's a transition where everyone only needs to look at tiny problems, tiny things, and think that you are you are contributing or solving things in a very individual way, whereas the only ones that keep the panopticon view, the whole grid, the tapestry grid, is only Google that will see it. All the rest, the, the specific utility companies, will only look at what they purchase the service for. And of course, it's a techno solutionist way of thinking about the problems we are facing as a society that ultimately just uh, pushes to see AI as a method for developing every form of green technology. So if we go back to the discussion about the secular stagnation to conclude. And now, for instance, we see a different split in terms of the productivity of the frontier firms and the laggard firms. We could basically say, okay, we need to cope with these companies because the intellectual monopolies are actually much more productive than all the rest. So the problem in a way of this stagnant figure are the rest, the laggard ones. But the problem is that uh, not only that they, it's very limited what we can take from such an aggregated variable, it's also, and with this I will finish, that in this type of mapping we are assuming that the value that an organization captures is the value that the organization created. So we are just claiming that those at the frontier are more productive because these companies basically are the ones that are capturing value from all the rest. So what seems to be a positive effect, in reality, is not as positive as it's measured. I'm not saying that they are not productive. I'm just saying that in the way it's measured, part of the value that they are supposed to be creating or generating is actually value captured. And there are a lot of negative effects that are directly associated and cannot be explained detached from the emergence of intellectual monopolies that plummet or contributes to uh, get this sort of overall stagnant figure. One is the startups, and the existence of startups, you would say, but they are the ones that are contributing to innovation. Yes, but they are, they are thousands of companies that hire people without creating any value from the standard way of thinking in terms of value. They are not selling anything at all. They lose money, they are constantly losing money, they are hiring workers, but they are not creating value. The laggard companies that exists by super exploiting their workers and capture more and more value from those that are further below and that are part of this ecosystem instead of being of disappearing as if we were under a scenario of creative destruction also contribute to uh, uh, the decrease of uh, productivity and the final one is very much associated to uh, the digital economy, but not only, which is the fact that we, in this uh, industrial stratification, we can no longer speak of unemployment as a problem in our societies, simply because of the expansion of informality. Different forms of informality that in peripheral countries already existed and with people selling on the street, that today also include all the gig economy. So all the people that are being replaced from mid-tier positions, for instance, by introducing digital technologies or AI, will not result in more unemployment. They will open an account on their phones and start working as a delivery person or as a driver. Of course, I'm simplifying the argument just to make it shorter. And all that contributes also to the stagnant figure. And all this is happening because we end up having a few companies that control the intangibles of our society. So really, 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 finishing. Uh, I mentioned Braverman and 
Braverman is already a reason enough to go beyond the economic myth of innovation as progress because we already see that, the, that technologies are being developed in part at least to control workers, to, to generate this split between those that conceive and those that execute and control and plan the labor of those that execute. From the peripheral countries perspective, we could also say that dependency is conditioned precisely because technologies are being captured by those from the north. Now we can add to that picture that even when peripheral countries produce knowledge, that knowledge is appropriated and monetized by those from the north. But intellectual monopoly capitalism makes all this worse and adds also its own uh, footprints to this discussion. Because what technologies we have and what we don't have, who access them, uh, it's directly related to the expansion of intellectual monopolies. The fact that we might be walking towards an unjust techno-solutionist transition as well, and all the other things also. So with this, uh, thank you, and sorry that I spoke for so long.